Hi, this is Mike Hendrickson from Software Architecture in London. I'm here with Shiva from Intel. Shiva, how you doing? Hey, pretty good. Glad to be here. Good. So, Intel's been talking a lot about FPGAs, Field Programmable Gate Arrays. Can you tell me a little bit what those are? Yeah, sure. So, FPGAs have actually been around for a while. Uh, the idea with FPGAs are you can describe any hardware system uh, you can imagine in this language called HDL, a hardware description language. Uh, a couple examples are Verilog and BHDL. You can describe it in this language, and much like the way you would write software, uh, you can write this um, in this specialized language, and you can use our tools to synthesize that description into a binary, which you can then program our FPGAs with. And our FPGAs will act like that hardware system. So this is in contrast to a CPU, where it's also programmable hardware, but it's a specialized instruction set. So when you program a CPU, um, all, you, all it's doing is running this predefined instruction set. With the FPGAs, the very f nature of the chip is flexible, uh, so that it can be, act like any possible hardware system. So there isn't an instruction set on the FPGAs? Not so much, no. Okay. It's basically a regular fabric um, that can, it's fully customizable based on what your needs are. And now, why, why is this appealing to an architect or a software architect? Why, what, what would their interest be in an FPGA? Yeah, so FPGAs have uh, definitely had an niche role um, leading up to um, the present times. You know, they've been around for a while and using a lot of different applications, which I won't go into. What's really exciting is now there's a push to get these things into the data center. Um, so to give an example why a software architect might want to use this, imagine uh, you have an application that does, let's say, a lot of compression. And your application, let's say, is running across thousands of servers. And let's say you're not profiling your application. And what do you see? You see that your application, which is doing compression, um, you're, you're seeing that most of the time is spent in, in compression, and it's really pegging your processor. You're like, well, I want to these processors to do other things, but most of the time they're just doing compression. So what you might think to yourself is, OK, let me create a specialized chip. Let me spend tens of millions of dollars and create a compression chip. So you go and do that, and you put it in your server, and now you, you have a performance increase from that comp specialized compression chip. Now let's say you want to do encryption instead. So you go buy a second chip that does encryption and you plug that into your uh, system. Spend another $10 million. Well now let's say you want to move to the next processor generation. Um, you want to sh you know, shrink your transistor size. Well now you spend $10 million creating a new chip, um, f a compression chip. And now clearly if you want to, now clearly Maybe you're willing to do that, but clearly that doesn't scale to hundreds of different types of accelerations. Now with an FPGA, you can put a single FPGA in your server, and with that single FPGA, you can run any number of workloads. Depending on your needs, you can on the fly switch in an accelerator based on your needs. So you want to do compression, you program in a compression. You want to do encryption, now you, sw you, sw you switch in a compression, uh, an encryption accelerator. Um, and that way it's, it's purely, purely uh, it's totally flexible. And then when you actually want to move to the next generation of uh, technology, you can just port it over to the next generation FPGA. You don't have to create a whole new chip yourself. You just move it to the next FPGA. And in that way, it'll be you know, very similar to what you experience with upgrading your processor. You don't expect to rewrite your entire software. You just move it over. So for the, the typical software architect, mm -hmm. do they have to understand hardware to be able to use these or to be able to think about how they would design a system that uses these? and? Use yeah, it effectively? It, it depends what kind of software architect you are. So we, we typically think of two types of users, the people who want to develop their own accelerator and the people who just want to use this stuff. So the people who want to develop their accelerator, um, let's say they have some special sauce and they, they really just, um, and, and they need to capture that. Uh, we have a couple options. One, they can do traditional FPJ development, in which case you really need to understand your hardware. Um, and in the case where you don't want to learn that traditional FPGA development, we have higher level abstractions like OpenCL. And you can describe your uh, accelerator in OpenCL and then and create an accelerator design that way. And OpenCL is the same language that's used for GPUs for, uh, for AMD. So it's a familiar uh, paradigm for software developers. So that's if you want to create your own accelerator. Now let's say you just want to get FPGA acceleration and you don't want to do a lot of work for it. Uh, and let's imagine, for example, going back to the compression ex example. Let's say you're just doing compression. You're not really doing a specialized compression. You're just doing compression. Well, then the, the idea is we're going to enable you with a whole uh, ecosystem of IP partners. Um, and you'll have 10 compression accelerators to choose from with different levels of performance and, and lossiness. So, and then you just pick the one that matches your needs. 
So in that way, depending on what kind of person you know you are, how, how specialized your case is, what your comfort level is, um, and where you want to spend your time, um, we'll have a variety of options to support you. So the architect needs to know what his system is intending to do, and that's a perfect example of where a software architect would pick the right components to make these FPGAs work most effectively with their software. And is it a big leap for them to to be able to use FPGAs? I mean, is, it, is our FPGAs going to be tough for companies to start using, or do you have a on-ramp kit or some way that people get started with this? Yeah, so th there's a lot of ways to get involved. Uh, so we actually just announced a, um, the programmable acceleration card. It's a um, an FPGA on a PCI card that you'll be able to just plug into your system. This will be available in the first half of 2018. Um, so just the same way you, you plug a graphics card into your system, you can get this PCI card, plug it in. It'll have the um, a base design on it, and all you'll need to, all you'll need to do is install this, our software stack. And the software stack, just to um, let you know a little bit about it, is it has a driver component, which is uh, a Linux driver component, which is being upstream. So you can go on the Linux mailing list and look at it right now. And it has a user space API that's also uh, open source, and that's on GitHub. So you'll have, you can actually start engaging with this right now if you want to. You can go online and start uh, playing with it and um, playing with things in simulation um, or emulation. Uh, and then when, you're, when you have the actual hardware in the first half of 2018, you can start uh, uh, playing with it. Now, there are, it, this stuff has also been deployed. Uh, this specific, specific uh, stack has been deployed um, by Alibaba. Uh, and we're engaging with pretty much all the big data center uh, operators. So is this, the FPGAs have come to kind of a, a point in time where we need them, because with the massive amounts of data and machine learning that we want to do to feed our AI applications so that they can bring back useful mm -hmm. material or information or actions or whatever we're bringing back through them, is that where we are in this world right now? Is that we actually have to have these sort of things? Is because we're coming to a yeah, point to where that, that, that's that's really getting into more of Intel's uh, you know broader, basically the, the broader things that are kind of driving uh, Intel right now, and that's really you know to talk about the data revolution, um, you know the virtuous cycle of growth, that it's, it's, and it's a buzzy word. And I don't like using it. Um, my manager loves loves it when I use it, so I'm using it. Um, it's it's this, this general sense that there's all these um, all these nodes coming online that are going to generate a mass amount of data, so that uh, and the very network itself has to improve to be able to handle this data, and the end data centers need to improve to uh, and need to scale out to handle all this uh, additional data. And that's not all on FPGAs. If you look at the way um, Intel's uh, in is investing, you know, they're, they're investing in improving their the core processors. They're investing they're investing in uh, various ASICs like Nirvana and Mobileye, and they're also investing in FPGAs. And all these things play a part in you know, this data revolution, being able to scale out all their systems, uh, everything from the end nodes to the fabric to the data centers, uh, to be able to support all this additional data. So is Intel becoming a software company or an AI company? I mean, I, uh, think, I think Intel's been a software company for a while. Uh, I mean, obviously our, our goal is to sell silicon, but uh, and your heritage yeah. is in the hardware world. Heritage as well. in the hardware, but th th you know they've always, to some extent, been a, been a software company. Um, you know, I think you'd be surprised by the number of software developers that are actually at Intel. Uh, I believe we're the number one, con we're either number one or two contributor to the Linux uh, community. We do tons of open source development, um, uh, specifically in optimizing for performance and that, that sort of thing. Um, so I think Intel's been a software a company for a while, and I think that'll just continue to, to grow. I think uh, one of the ways they describe Intel nowadays is as a data company. You know, just kind of align it with this whole idea of a data revolution and how we're trying to support that. Excellent, so Shiva, if you and I sit down 12 months from now, what would you like to see happening in the market that you guys are in right now? In, and uh, when I say you guys are in, Intel in general and specifically towards FPGAs? Yeah, so um, specifically towards FPGAs, I'd like to see every, every one of the uh, Super 7 data center operators, um, you know, I could name those, uh, you know, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, 
um, Facebook. I like them all to have uh, see them all have the, uh, these uh, FPGA uh, offerings because the the key to getting adoption is to make it available. And it, I think while it's nice having your own hardware, a lot of times the people just want to be able to you know get easy access to this. So I think in the next year, the key thing for me would be one availability. So ha having all these different people having their have ho having offerings, uh, and the second would be. Uh, the uh, ecosystem. I would like to see a lot of uh, offerings uh, by third-party IP developers um, and uh, seeing a rich ecosystem that the end user can uh, pick from. Because if the end user has availability um, and a lot of and a rich, rich ecosystem, um, I think they'll find it very engaging. Because the performance is there. We know FPGAs uh, can kill it with performance. We know that they work in a lot of different areas. It's really going to come down to availability and usability. And I think in the next year, we'll see some pretty significant gains. Excellent, Shiva. We look forward to that conversation then. Thank All you. Right. Thank you.